Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Matt Jarbo. This is Stranger Days. And you know, I like weird stuff. I like old, weird stuff. And I find unsolved murders or, or really unanswerable murders to be something that is always interesting to dive into. And so the other day I was actually recommended this story, the story from July 1806, 215 years ago, where a man by the name of Captain James Purington murdered his whole family. And that is something that it doesn't seem out of place for some of these topics, but no one has ever been able to figure out why. And all we really have to go on information wise is an old July 6th, 1806 newspaper clipping that has been saved by the Library of Congress that actually breaks down the events of that night to give us an idea of just how bad things were. So this is what we know. At an early hour, the inhabitants of this town, and this was Augusta, Maine, by the way, were alarmed with the dreadful information that Captain James Purinton, in cold blood, had murdered his wife, six children, and himself. His oldest son, with a slight wound escape, and his second daughter was found desperately wounded and probably supposed dead by the father. So yes, in the middle of the night, Captain James Purington went into his house and he murdered his wife, six of his children. He thought he killed his oldest son who got away and another daughter who was wounded deeply, but thought to be dead. And then he took his own life. Now, between the hours of two and three, a neighbor was awakened by the boy who escaped with an incoherent account of the horrid scene of which he had just fled. He, with another neighbor, instantly ran to the spot. And there, after having lit a candle, a scene was presented, which beggars all description. Oh, and they do describe it, by the way. So let's quickly recap. You have the youngest boy. He gets out of the house. He runs to the neighbors. They come back over, and here before them is a sight of all these bodies. In the outer room lay Captain Purington on his face and weltering in his gore, the perpetrator of this dreadful deed, his throat cut in the most shocking manner, and the bloody razor lying on the table by his side. So yeah, that's how he killed himself. He used a gun on other people, but he took a razor a straight razor, and he slit his own throat before bleeding out. But in an adjoining room, his wife, Mrs. Purinton, lay in her bed, her head almost severed from the body, and near her on the floor, their little daughter, about 10 years old, who was probably hearing the cries of her mother, ran to her relief from the apartment in which she slept and was murdered by her side. In another apartment was found the two oldest and youngest daughters, first age 19, dreadfully butchered, the second desperately wounded, reclining with her head on the body of a dead infant at 18 months old. And in the state of horror and almost total insensibility, in the room with the father lay in bed with their throats cut, the two youngest sons, one of eight, the other six years old, and in another room was found on the hearth the most dreadfully mangled the second son, aged 12. He had fallen with his trousers under one arm, which with he had attempted to escape. Brutal. That's absolutely brutal. This guy went through systematically room by room by room and slaughtered his family. Just slaughtered him with what appears to be an ax and a razor blade. I said a gun. I thought it was a gun. That's my mistake. But still, think of that sight. Think of that horrific, horrific finding. And the one girl still alive, resting with her dead 18-month-old sister. That is just horrifying. But it goes on. Over the fireplace was the distinct impression of a bloody hand where the unhappy victim probably supported himself before he fell. The whole house seemed covered with blood and near the body of the murdered lay the deadly axe. From the surviving daughter, we have no account 
of this transaction. Her dangerous situation prevents any communication, and but faint hopes are entertained for her recovery. She died a few days later. But the son, the surviving son, 17 years old, we learn the following. That he was awakened by piercing cries of his mother, and involuntarily shrieking himself, he leapt from his bed and ran towards the door of his apartment. He was met by his father with an axe in his hand, who struck him. But being so near to each other, the axe passed over his shoulder, and one corner of it entered his back, making a slight wound. His father then struck him once or twice and missed. But at this moment, his younger brother, who slept in the same bed with him, jumped from it and attempted to get out the door. To prevent this, the father attacked him, which gave the eldest son an opportunity to escape. During this dreadful conflict, not a word was uttered. That's crazy. Guy comes in to kill his eldest son with an axe. The son barely gets away. The younger one gets up to run, and the dad immediately turns his attention to the 12-year-old, allowing the 17-year-old to escape. There's got to be serious survivor's guilt on that kid after the fact. that You'd have to assume there'd be massive survivor's guilt after that. But here's where we get into the condition of the bodies when they were found. From the appearance of the wounds generally, it seemed that the design of Purington was to dissever the heads from the bodies, excepting the two youngest, whose throats it is supposed were cut with a razor. The oldest daughter and second son had several wounds, the probable consequence of their resistance. We have no evidence to lead us satisfactorily to the motives for this barbarous and unnatural deed. And they actually don't have a motive. They have ideas about what the motive might be. But to get to that point, we have to go back a little bit. We have to learn more about Captain James Purington, who at the time of his massacre and of his death was 46 years of age and had, within recent years, moved to this town to become an independent farmer with, according to this, a handsome estate of steady, correct, and industrious habits and of good character and fair reputation, and strongly attached to his family. So he was an independent businessman, a farmer who loved his family. That is what people thought about James Purington up until this moment in time. However, he had been heard lately saying that he had felt much distressed at the unpromising appearance of his farm, that he should be destitute of bread for his family and hay for his cattle, and dreaded the consequences. So that kind of paints a picture. It paints an interesting picture about James Purington at that point in time, looking at the state of affairs and absolutely freaking the hell out. He's losing his mind. He's freaked out over this. His he's, farm could go up in ruins. Family would be out on their ass. They have no food. They could starve. I get it. Those are some seriously midlife crisis stuff right there. And there's some evidence to kind of back this up. There's some evidence to kind of suggest that this is where his mind was. Because the Sunday before his death, and this is what it said, he wrote a letter to his brother and informed him that on the reception of this letter, he should be dead. And requesting him to take charge of his family. In that letter was a death's head marked out and it was sealed with black. I don't really know what that means. I'm, I'm assuming black wax. It was found on Monday by his wife, and it gave her the greatest alarm and uneasiness. This her husband perceiving and learning the cause, he attempted to console her by assurances that he had no intention of committing suicide, but that he had a basically like a, you know, premonition of his approaching death. So why might he be cavalier about this? He figured he was going to die. That's what he thought. He wrote a letter to his brother saying, hey, listen, when you find this, I'm going to be dead. His wife finds it. She freaks out. He tells her, no, baby, 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 baby. I love you, baby. Everything's fine. It's all good. I'm just joking around. We're going to be fine. But I mean, like, I have a premonition that I'm going to die, but don't worry, you're going to be good. And you got to kind of ask yourself, what, what would prompt him at that point to still continue to go down this path where he killed everyone? Well, he attempted to at least. Then we get into what his religion was. 
And his religion actually kind of starts to put more pieces of this puzzle together. So Purington was a warm believer in the doctrine of universal salvation. Though it is not said that he was a bigoted maniac or a religious enthusiast. But his whole conduct today preceding the murder and during the last day, it seems marked with the utmost coolness and deliberation. So they're piecing together his last movements. Towards the end of the day, he ground the fatal axe. And when the family retired to bed, he was left reading the Bible. They actually talked to the son, and the son said that when he went to bed, he left his father sitting at home reading the Bible. Like a normal night. No one had questioned any of that. So it would seem that he led his family to believe that everything was fine, presented it as such, but still took the preparations. Now, again, did this have anything to do with the doctrine of universal salvation? Well, there's an author by the name of James North who wrote a book about the history of Augusta, which does briefly touch upon the Purington axe murders. In it, he gives an account of James Purington's potential mental state leading up to the massacre. And this is what he says. He frequently, however, changed his religious sentiments and finally became a believer in the doctrine of universal salvation, was said to be a kind and affectionate in his family and an obliging neighbor. He was observed at times to be elated or depressed as his affairs were prosperous or otherwise. He was greatly despondent on account of the drought of this year and expressed fears that his crops would be cut off, his cattle starve, and his family suffer from want. But fears were not entertained by his neighbors, to whom he had expressed his feelings, that he mediated violence. So, what I'm thinking here is that he was manic. He was depressed, potentially bipolar. Definitely mental illness plays into this somehow. Because he would always kind of, you know, be freaking out. And his neighbors, you know, they were aware of it. This was a small area. This was like a small, think of it like a cul-de-sac of farms. You know, in, in Augusta in 1806, like on the outskirts of the main part of the city. So they would all know what's going on, right? And again, like the night before the massacre, all things seemed normal according to the son. He left his father reading the Bible and he went to bed. But in the morning, when the neighbors showed up and they discovered the massacre, they found the Bible and it was open to the book of Ezekiel. Now, I don't know what the book of Ezekiel means, what its significant is, and nothing I've been able to read has been able to touch upon that. But what was really interesting was the funeral, and James North's book actually finishes out his segment on James Purington by describing the funeral. So I'm going to summarize this, but this is basically what it says. On the day of the funeral, the townsfolk, some, some select men, moved the remains of the victims into a meeting house, right? I think like a wake. It was like, I don't know if it was open casket, probably not, but it was definitely inside of a house. But James's body was not brought in the house. In fact, his remains were left on the porch with the ax and the razor on his coffin. They were left there overnight. And the next day, a vast concourse of people gathered for the funeral. And when, I, when they say this, what they really mean is that it is a lot of people like it filled the streets and there were people on the tops of houses that trying to watch this procession walk by. Then after Reverend Joshua Taylor, a Methodist minister, preached the funeral sermon, the remains of the mother and the six children were taken across the bridge to Burnt Hill Burying Ground and in the northeast corner of the cemetery, they were buried. But James's body did not get that. Keep in mind, they'd already left him outside. He wasn't allowed to go inside the meeting house to be viewed by their friends and family. He was left outside because F that guy, basically. Now, the remains of his were taken away without ceremony with the axe and the razor, and they were buried together near the highway, near the southwest corner of the burying ground at the corner of Winthrop and High Streets. They didn't want the father to be buried with the family, so they cast him out and buried him by himself. Then, of course, the procession returned to the meeting house and they were dismissed after a prayer was read by a man 
named Reverend Eliphet Gillett. But there was someone who was there, a Congregationalist named Preacher Timothy Merritt, who talked a bit about James and talked a bit more about this doctrine of universal salvation and what it could actually mean. And he said, You all know that for some years past he has professed to believe firmly that all mankind, immediately upon leaving the body, go to a state of the most perfect rest and enjoyment. And to my own certain knowledge, he denied the doctrine of the day of judgment and retribution. Of course, it was no question with him whether his family would regenerate or born again, or in other words, they were prepared for so sudden a removal from this world. It was therefore natural, and what anyone would do under the same circumstances, to endeavor to prevent the anticipated trouble of his family and them all forever happy. There is every reason to believe that this was his real motive. So think about that. Captain James Purington, 46 years old, father of eight, loving husband, loving father, farmer, independent businessman, respected in his community, believed in the doctrine of universal salvation, which preaches reincarnation, and that he believed so firmly that his family would be reincarnated, born again, resurrected maybe, into a different body, that he felt that there was nothing to worry about in regards to his death and their death. But if you go back a little bit, if you go back a little bit to that letter he sent to his brother, he was already intending on killing himself. He firmly believed that he would regenerate, that he would be reincarnated. And those plans, I believe, were thwarted when his wife found the letter. At that point, he had to take them all out because he believed in his mind he would regenerate, which means he believed in his mind they would regenerate. Unfortunately, that's not how this stuff works. At least I don't know. I haven't gotten to that point. Personally, I don't believe in reincarnation. That's just me. But this man did. And he took out seven people, eight people, including himself with his one son surviving. I don't know what happened to that kid. I hope he had a decent life. I hope he got the hell out of Augusta, Maine and made something of himself. But the city, they knew the evil, which is why they buried him away from the family. And that to me is the most telling part. Because the person who recommended the story to me went through Augusta, Maine and learned about these murders and was shocked that even the historical society in the town, according to this person, didn't know the exact burying place of James Purington. So if I'm ever in Augusta, Maine, that might be something I have to look up. Or if you live in Augusta, Maine, I want to know your thoughts on this. Have you heard the story before? And what do you think is the reason why he committed the acts that he is claimed to have done? Let me know down in the comment section here on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave a like, leave a review. Find me on Twitter, Adam Jarbo. And if you want to support Stranger Days podcast, patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo. Guys, thank you again so much for listening to this. Hope you enjoyed it. Have yourself a great day and peace out.